Good afternoon and welcome to another one of Don OSBP's Ask Me Anything webinar. We're so happy that all of you could join us today. Today we have the pleasure of having NAFC's small business professionals answer all of your questions. Ann Bannister and Mr. Dan Duckowitz are here to speak to you. I'm turning it over to you guys. Okay, thanks Mercedes. Good afternoon everyone. And I wanna thank um, Don OSBP for inviting us to participate in this great series, Open Office Hours, which means everything is on the table. We can speak about whatever. And I think this is a great forum for us to engage with our small business community. So again, big shout out to Don OSBP for putting this on. So before I get started, I'm not sure if Destiny or Mercedes was going to put up the slides. Excellent, there you go, thank you. So before I get started, um, I kind of wanted to go over um, a little bit about NAVC um, in our organization before I get to the questions. From my understanding, we received a lot of questions. So that's a great thing. That shows that people are interested in learning more about NAVC and how they can do business with us. So I'll get started with the next slide, please. Okay, so um, I always like to start with this slide whenever I'm giving a presentation because it's so in extremely important to understand NAVC's mission. If you don't understand NAVC's mission, you will not understand how to do business with us. NAVC's mission is we design, build, deliver, and maintain ships and systems on time and on cost for the United States Navy. So that's a pretty simple mission statement, but boy, it packs a punch. What we do is very important for the warfighter, and we look to our industry partners to help us be successful in that. In order to, do our, to accomplish our mission, we manage over 150 acquisition programs. And as a provider command, we have the responsibility of directing the proper mix of resources to maintain and equip the fleet. So a little bit more about NAVC. Uh, NAVC is, has over 85,000 employees. It's comprised of command staff, headquarter directorates, program executive office, PEOs, and numerous field activities. NAVC is also the largest of the Navy's five systems commands with a fiscal year budget of over $40 billion. So in January of this year, NAVC's commander, Vice Admiral Galinas, issued NAVC's campaign plan to expand the advantage 3.0. So campaign plan 3.0 builds on the foundation of our previous campaign plan and the work of the one NAVC team. Our campaign plan flows directly from the CNO's navigation plan and it's focused on readiness, capabilities, capacity, and our sailors and our continued efforts to expand the advantage. So as I said, our campaign plan focuses on three mission priorities. The first one is to deliver combat power through the on-time delivery of combat ready ships, submarines and systems. Second is to transform our digital capability. And third is to build a team to compete and win. So I wanted to make sure I touched on our mission priorities because as small businesses hoping to enter our marketplace, it's extremely important that you understand our priorities. Knowing our priorities will help you better align your products and services to help us meet these missionaries. At any time you have an opportunity to speak with the NAVC small business team or even with one of our requirement holders, make sure your elevator pitch is crafted in a way to show your alignment to these three missionaries. Um, I always like to say this, I have small businesses come up and they will start off the elevator pitch with, hello, I'm a hub zone, I'm a service disabled veteran owned, I'm a woman owned small business. That is great. But the first thing I wanna hear is how can you help us meet mission? That will make my ears perk up and then I'll be like, okay, who can I get you in front of? Cause you understand what it takes to help NAVC win. Next slide. Um, okay, so my office is located at the Washington Navy Yard, but NAVC has 21 field activities as listed on this map. 
Each of our field activities has a small business office headed up by a designated small business professional. So the portfolios at each of our field activities is different. So when researching, working with NAVC, you should search all of our field, ex field activities. For example, our program executive offices, PEOs, use our field activities to contract for their professional support services. So you may be looking for front office support for let's say PEO ships, but NSWC Crane, one of our field activities, may be the activity handling that procurement. Uh, I provide information later on in the slide about our small business professionals at our field activities and how to reach out to them. Next slide. So this is a quick snapshot of our summary of FY21 small business spend. In FY21, NAVC obligated close to $4 billion in small business prime obligations, and we were successful in meeting all of our socioeconomic performance goals. In FY20, our spend was a little over $3.8 billion. So I'm happy to report that we've been showing a constant uptick in our small business obligations over the years. And again, I want to caveat and say when we made all those circles green by reaching our socioeconomic goals, it wasn't because we went out specifically looking for those companies that fell in those categories. What we look for is companies that can help us meet mission. And just so happened, by doing so, we found great small businesses, which I knew would be the case. Next slide. So this slide just kind of shows a breakout of what a breakout of what we buy. Knowledge-based services rank number one in FY21 at a little over one and a half billion dollars. This is primarily our professional support services um, at NAVC headquarters and across our field activities. Followed by that is equipment-related services, and that includes maintenance, repair, and overhaul of our weapons systems. Um, when you look at this slide, look to see where you fit as a small business. This is not inclusive of all the work we have small businesses doing for us because a lot of our small businesses are competing and winning work that was once only seen as applicable to large, large businesses. But this slide does show where small businesses are most successful within the NAVC enterprise. Next slide. So this is a bit of an eye chart, but I'm sure the slides will be available. This slide lists our 21 field activities. It has contact information for my office, as far as all of our warfare centers, regional maintenance centers, soup ships, and Navy uh, naval shipyards. So again, I think it's always important to reach out, connect with the small business professionals in whatever region you're interested in, and we can start building relationships because I always like to close by saying, we don't know you are out there unless you tell us you're out there. That's how we uh, get you involved with NAVC. And with that, I'm going to now get into the questions. Before we start the questions, I just want to let all of the participants know, please use the Q&A function to ask questions as that's what will be monitored um, when providing the questions to Ms. Bannister and Mr. Duckowitz. Um, the chat is more for you guys to collaborate amongst yourselves, but please be sure to put your questions in the Q&A function. Okay, Ann, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Okay, Dan, I'm gonna let you kick it off. Hey, great. <clears throat> so we got a lot of questions. We're really excited that um, so many people had interest in uh, hearing more about NAPC and how to do business with us, especially our small business partners. Um, so let's roll into this uh, this big uh, pile, pile of questions we got. <laughs> the first the first one is, uh, what are we looking for in small business? Okay, so Dan, I'm going to take that one because I just spoke about that when I talked about the mission, right? So at the end of the day, what we do that's most important to us is supplying the warfighter with what they need to be successful. Anytime um, you are looking to do business with us, understand what our mission is. Understand what our small business strategy is. So NAFC has a website 
where you can go on the Forward Facing website and under business partnerships, you'll find a bunch of resources that would be really helpful for you to uh, look up and read. For example, we have our small business strategies located on our website. The small business strategies are basically strategies put together by our program executive offices, PEOs, and it talks about how they're going to include small businesses in their procurements. Um, it's very important to read that so you can kind of get an understanding of what these program offices are looking for. So when you do get an opportunity to speak with them, you know uh, how to craft your, your marketing or your elevator pitch to them. Um, also on our um, forward facing website, we also list uh, past industry day presentations. We have an industry day every year. The last couple of years has been virtual. This year, we're hoping it to be a hybrid environment, partly uh, in person and um, by Microsoft Teams virtually. But we always post presentations that our requirement holders give during that industry day. That's another excellent resource because you can read those presentations to learn more about the organization and what their needs are. Again, to be successful with NAVC, it's so important to understand our mission and our vision and align yourself with us from that way. Any extra thoughts, Dan? Yeah, I would just say um, from small businesses specifically, in addition to aligning with the mission, I think, you know, um, we have a lot of manufacturing uh, heavy uh, requirements and one of the the real strategic benefits of partnering with small businesses is having a more distributed industrial base that's more resilient and can scale um, in times of need. Um, so I think, you know, that competition, innovation, and that resiliency, as we all saw in the supply chain, um, having a domestic uh, supply chain that's very resilient, especially in these manufacturing um, product lines, is super important and one of the the kind of the key strategic advantages of having a strong small business industrial base, having a lot of small business partners for us. Yep, I, I agree. And I think it's so important to know as a small business, when you're uh, marketing your services to us, understand what your competitive advantage is. You should have one, and that should be the one thing that you can say, this is what I can bring to the table and what I can do for you. Because there's so many small businesses out there, you know, we really need you to make yourself stand out. So understanding your competitive advantage and how that fits with us would be key. Okay. Great. We'll so the, the yeah, the next question is, how does NAPSI leverage FAR 13 for opportunities within the simplified acquisition threshold? Um, and I'll take a stab at this. I know at, at headquarters where Ms. Bannister and I work, um, uh, these are very rare actions. Um, the actions we are typically dealing with are multi-million dollar uh, procurements of ships and systems. Um, in the field activities that Ms. Bannister had that map earlier, I think you'll see uh, more opportunities in this dollar threshold range. Um, I think for headquarters specifically, we are supported by NSWC Corona uh, for simplified acquisition uh, procedure type actions. Um, so it is an area of opportunity, but um, I think as we saw, NAPSI is obligating around $40 billion a year in contracts, um, and the, the vast majority of those dollars are obligated above the simplified acquisition threshold of 250 k um, The next question is, what percentage of our budget is set aside for small business contracts? Hmm, that's an interesting question because... We actually do not set aside a budget. Um, so the budget, the sky's the limit. You know, we're looking for those small businesses that can um, partner with us and help us be successful. So um, we don't per se set aside. I know we have goals that are assigned to us by Don OSBP. Um, last year, that goal was 10 points. No, last year, that goal was what, 8%? 8, 8 yeah, th this year our, our goal is 10.67. Yes, okay, this year is 10.67. So every year we are assigned goals um, by Don OSBP, um, but as far as an actual percentage of our budget that's set aside, we actually do not set the aside a portion. 
So, you know, you guys come meet with us and, and show us what we can, what you can do for us and we can exceed any kind of uh, percentage that's ever assigned to us by Don OSBP, which is what I like to do. So, yeah, more, the more money to small businesses, the better. So al along those lines, the next question is, what is the Navy doing to meet the increased small business utilization goals uh, set by the Biden administration? You know, I would say um, one of the things that we're going to do, we, we're trying to do more targeted outreach. Um, you know, we don't know you're out there. I always say we don't know you're out there unless you let us know you're out there, right? So um, we're trying to do more targeted outreach. My office, we perform capability briefings um, um, on Thursdays from, they're done virtually 30 minutes so we can get to know um start building relationships with some of these small businesses out there that are new to entering our marketplace. Um, I think that's the best thing that we can do is just increase our outreach and, and find those companies. I think teaming up with other DOD agencies as well with their outreaches would probably be a good idea because there are companies working, let's say, for the Army who could maybe be applicable to doing work for the Navy, and they're not making that cross connection, and, and we need to do more of that because I think if you work with DOD, it should be a applicable across all of DOD. So we're trying to find those companies as well. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, in addition to that, um, so th I think this year was the first time NAVSI attended the 8A conference in Orlando um, to, to provide specific outreach to um, SDB businesses. And so so NAVSI itself is is being proactive and, and trying to, like you said, make that kind of tailored outreach um, to find those firms because as you said, it's not, we're not just trying to make the numbers, we're trying to make our mission with those businesses where it makes sense. So in order to do that with so many specialized requirements at NAFC, um, we have quite a mandate to, to go out and meet a lot of companies um, to find the right ones that can provide value to the Navy and to our sailors. Um, so doing things like having specific uh, outreach events like that, I know we're actively internally looking for those opportunities that can be um, fulfilled through the 8A program uh, to help increase our 8A uh, performance numbers um, and encourage, especially, you know, double encourage any 8A firms um, that are here joining us today to attend our NAVC Industry Day. That's going to be on October 5th um, from 9 to 4 p.m. Uh, the Eventbrite, I'm going to drop a link in the chat, is open. Uh, it's a hybrid event. Right now, you can register for virtual attendance. There's going to be a limited number of spots for in-person registration, and that those will go live on Wednesday at nine eight. Uh, no, at, at noon, noon Eastern time. Eventbrite the live person in-person registration will go live. Those will sell out very quickly. Uh, so, if you'd like to come to Washington Navy Yard and attend our industry day. Um, you or someone on your staff will need to be next to the computer at noon on Wednesday <laughs> to, to get those tickets. Because like we, like I said, we have a limited capacity. Um, virtual attendance is pretty much unlimited. So, um, you know, don't stress too much if you don't get to come in person. We're really excited to have companies come back in person um, after a couple of years of doing this virtually. Uh, but if you can't come, there'll be other opportunities. A lot of our program staff and contracting staff attend um, uh, various, you know, American Society of Naval Engineer events, Sierra Space, uh, Don OSBP's upcoming event, Gold Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's going to be other opportunities, especially as, you know, we transition more away from the virtual to hybrid and more in-person events. So um, please keep an eye on that and stay in touch with us. Let's see, what's the next one? Uh, do firms need to be registered to their local Navy base or with Don overall? Hmm. Um, so I would say for the majority of requirements I'm aware of, there isn't a formal registration process with say NAVC. Um, it's are you procurement ready to do business with the federal government and with the Department of the Navy? And along those lines, um, Don OSVP has a, a really great set of resources called Eight Steps to Becoming Procurement Ready on their website. Um, so I'd say, you know, 
we we definitely encourage people to send us their capability statements so we can be aware of them. But that's more for our strategic market research awareness. Uh, it's not like a check the block to be able to potentially bid on a specific contract. Any requirements like that, you're going to see in the request for proposals on SAM.gov or for the most part, professional support services with NAFC are awarded on the the Seaport multiple award contract vehicle. And that's where you're going to find those key requirements to be able to, to bid on a contract. But just for general, how do I get procurement ready? I really recommend that that page on the Don OSBP website, in addition to leveraging your Procurement Technical Assistance Center um, locally for more of those resources on becoming procurement ready. Uh, so kind of along those lines, one of the other questions was, um, how do I get started with, with Don contracts? Did you have any other kind of uh, no, you know, you touched, comments on that? No, you touched on PTAX, and I think that's so important because I think that's a, a resource that sometimes small businesses don't utilize. Um, the PTAX are an excellent resource. You know, they're there for you to help you. They're um, set up regional. Um, I think one of the questions was, how do I find uh, more about PTAX? I believe you can Google um, PTAX and it will come up where you can find out which uh, PTAC is in your region. And um, I highly uh, suggest that folks uh, utilize those services because they're there for you and they can help you a whole lot when it comes to trying to help you maneuver through uh, the DOD marketplace. Yeah, definitely. You know, the Department of Defense is jointly funding these. So those are, you know, your public funds are going into these centers to help you become procurement ready, provide you with tools. I know there's things like bid match services, and um, they're oftentimes staffed by people with 30, 40 years of federal procurement experience and can be really great resources for you to, to kind of step around some of the holes that you can step in when you're starting to do business with the, the federal government and the Navy specifically. Uh, so definitely encourage leaning on those PTACs and leveraging the, the assistance that they can provide. Uh, a lot of questions I'm seeing, yeah, we got a, a couple more that are kind of along these lines of getting procurement ready. Um, mm -hmm. We have another one. Um, what is the best way to market my business to the Navy? Kind of a little more specific. Yeah, um, I always say let's start by introducing yourself to the small business office, right? Um, we want to help you be successful, and um, we kind of know what our requirement hold. We know what our requirement holders are looking for. We understand the lingo of the Navy. If you're new to working with the Navy, um, I would say schedule a meeting with the small with my office. One of our 21 field activities to introduce yourself. We can give you tips on things you can do to better position yourself when you do have an opportunity to uh, get in front of a requirement holder so you can be better um, positioned to market your services and products. So I think it's always, I think relationship building is, is huge um, when you're starting out as a small business. I worked for small business for about 18 years and I know that was the one a uh, big takeaway that I, that I had is it's so important to build relationships, not only with the government requirement holders, but also with other companies for subcontracting opportunities. We started out when I was working for small doing subcontracting to get our foot in the door, so to speak. So um, that's another way you can market yourself. But again, reach out to my office and, and introduce yourself and start building that relationship with us. Great. Yeah. I if I can add a little bit more to that, yeah. you know, definitely building that relationship with us, but also, um, you know, just like any other customer kind of thinking about your Navy customer, what's, what's their experience like if they want to buy from you? Um, this isn't something that happens all the time, but sometimes I hear, Hey, I, have, I would love this to be broken out. It's a new product that needs to be tested and you can get it from this contract vehicle and I don't have any Navy experience. Each one of those is a different type of friction point for a Navy customer trying to buy your product or service or introduces some kind of risk or uncertainty for them. So um, just kind of be cognizant of, I mean, you better have a, a really amazing product if you're asking for more than one of those, <laughs> those friction points, you know? So just kind of be mindful of 
what's what's the experience for the Navy customer trying to acquire my product or service? And, you know, um, kind of be realistic about how many hoops you're going to get uh, someone to jump through to be able to access your product or service. Um, another question we have is, does contractor location matter to NAVC? Um, I'll, I'll say for professional support services, you will sometimes see, uh, must be able to get to us within an hour or something like that. If you see something that seems really unduly restrictive, uh, please send us a note and we can have a conversation with the, the requirement holder to see what's the rationale behind this. Does it make sense? Can this be loosened a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, for availabilities, uh, depending on the length of the availability, they, uh, so this is a, a ship repair um, contract I'm talking about now. Um, if it's anticipated to last longer than a year, it typically must be competed uh, along the entire coast. For shorter ship repair availabilities, uh, those can be restricted to a home port area, so they may have uh, location restrictions around those ship repair contracts. Uh, you'll see less of those location restrictions on, you know, maybe a manufactured product that's going to be delivered. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, you know, sometimes it can be restrictive when um, a solicitation comes out and says something like, you know, must be five miles from the base or from the location. Um, again, like Dan said, when you see that, bring it to our attention so we can investigate it further. Sometimes it's justifiable. Let's say they need you to come over to be in a skiff, to be in a secret area on the base, and they need, may need you to come over and, and get there in 30 minutes or less. Um, so that's one maybe the the rationale behind that um, uh, distance that they put in that uh, solicitation. But again, let us know and we'll look into it further. But yeah, I would say it's all dependent, but it should not be uh, something that would prevent us from working with you if it's not really a requirement or need. Great, and kind of going back to that thing, I'm excited that we have a lot of companies that are have maybe haven't done business with the Navy. Um, we are seeing a lot of those questions though. So I'm just, I'll give it, I'll give it maybe one more uh, different angle on the same kind of question is, can you give okay. tips to companies that are new to the government contracting work? Um, the tip I would give um, is just understanding, understanding where your company fits into our industrial base, our mission, our vision, understanding how you fit and what's your competitive advantage, you know, um, that is so important. If you get an opportunity to talk to someone that, that that's actually got the money and ready to spend it, they just don't want to know that you're just, okay, I'm, I'm just a certain socioeconomic class or I'm just, I provide professional support services. What do you bring to the table that's your competitive advantage? Be ready to, to be able to sing that on a dime, you know, have that all geared up because you never know when you might be at an outreach event and you reach that particular person. Maybe it might be a captain, an admiral, a program manager. You have that 30 seconds and just be ready to show what your competitive advantage is. That, that's the one major thing I would, would uh, tip I would give and to understand the mission of the organization because across the Department of the Navy, we all operate under a different mission. Even at our field activities, we all operate under a different mission. So it's under, it's great to understand that. I think that would be my major tip. What about you, Dan? Yeah, I think understanding the mission is so, it's so key. Um, and also, you know, if, you, if you're really brand new to government contracting is, um, there's a lot of things that are frustrating about uh, selling to the government. We have a lot of security requirements. Uh, you'll see the the clauses in in your RFP will be a mile long, and <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of that is you know it's a it's a history book of way of ways people have messed up in the past in government contracting, and so we needed rules and regulations put in there, and they accumulate over time. Um, but I will say, uh, it's not a secret. All of the, all of these rules and processes are in the public domain for you to understand them. Um, it may take a little bit of time to get spun up on them and to fully understand them. There are resources like the P tax. There's yep. uh, 
There's great resources on LinkedIn, on YouTube to learn about this. And um, if you have a, a product or service that can really benefit the Navy and our sailors and Marines, um, I know Ms. Bansner and I encourage you to, to kind of put up with some of that and to deal with it because we, we need that. We need the innovation. We need the great products. We need the great uh, understanding of how to deliver value to customers. So uh, if, if, if you have something that we can buy, um, you know, it's never going to be perfect. We're never going to make it as simple as buying commercially. We just have unique security requirements and right. legislative requirements that will always be different than buying the commercial marketplace. But um, with some of that pain comes, I think, the satisfaction of knowing that you're supporting our sailors and Marines and our nation's security. So it's a little bit of a trade off, but kind of coming into that with eyes wide open that it's right. going to be different. And there's a little bit of a learning curve. Yeah. And I would say, don't give up. Don't, don't turn around after yeah. your first no. You're going to get a couple, you know, so don't give up, you know, just keep trying, keep persevering, keep talking to people and, you know, you're going to get that open door. So just, you know, be persistent. And I also want to put a plug in for DAU, which has a podcast series for small businesses to um, understand a little bit more about doing business with um, the DOD. So that's a other resource and that's at um, DAU. I don't know if it's, D is it DAU.org or .david.mil? But I think it's got an e edu address, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's Defense Acquisition University. University. So if you Google that and, and put in small business, you'll find um, another resource for um, information on how to work with us. Another great resource. Um, let's see the next question. Uh, so we're, we're rolling through a lot of questions we got ahead of time. If you're if you've put something in the Q and A and hasn't been answered yet. Um, we appreciate uh, your interest in the Q&A stuff. We are kind of rolling through with some of this backlog that we got ahead of time, um, just so the participants are kind of aware. Um, the next uh, one that I'm going to pull up here is, what are the best ways to improve our consideration for contracts when our past performance is only in the private sector? Hmm, private sector past performance. Well, um, show how it fits into the DOD space onto the Department of Navy space as well. Um, you know, we have commercialization programs that we can take commercial products and try to help transition them to DOD. So um, don't get discouraged just because your past performance is commercial. Um, oh, another way you can try to bolster that experience that you have with commercial is if you can somehow get work as a subcontractor. Um, subcontracting with a um, another company that's doing work with the Navy or DOD is a great way to get experience in some past performance. I believe they're now going to let uh, subcontracting past performance count um, as your actual past performance. So that's another avenue to uh, investigate as well. I think that's a great um, answer where, you know, if, if you're just on your own, making sure you make it as clear as possible to someone that's rating your past performance, how it relates to their requirement. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, I know a lot of firms want to pursue prime contracting, but uh, kind of being realistic. And again, looking at it from a Navy customer's viewpoint, especially if you're in professional support services or another marketplace where we have pretty healthy competition. Um, if, if, if you pretend you're the Navy customer and we have three firms and one of them has Navy past performance and they're all offering similar prices, why would that Navy customer not go with the person who has the past performance um, with the Navy? It's lower risk for them. So how do you position yourself to be in that spot? A lot of times it's through subcontracting. So um, it may not be your end goal to be purely a subcontractor. We know we have a lot of firms that they thrive in that marketplace and, and that's their business strategy. Um, but really making sure we take a look at, you know, subcontracting as being a proven path to getting past performance that can be then leveraged later on for, for prime opportunities. Um, we have a couple of questions about the forecast. Where's the forecast? Uh, how do we access the forecast? Uh, yeah, a lot of forecast questions. Um, so the forecast, which will often um, abbreviate uh, 
at NAVSI as the LRAF. Uh, so that's the long range acquisition forecast that's on our public website. When you go to the NAVSI website, you're going to go to business opportunities and there's a little drop down under there. It's going to say LRAF. You're going to click on that and you'll see uh, a forecast for headquarters and then a, he a forecast for our field activities. The headquarters forecast is going to be heavily weighted towards ships and systems. Um, yeah. So you're going to see a lot of high dollar value ones on there for those types of requirements. If you're mainly working with professional support services, uh, I would head to the, the field activity one first um, and take a look at that. We've made a lot of efforts uh, and we really appreciate the efforts of our uh, partners in the contracting shop to improve the forecast and the level of detail of information that's available in it. And that's an ongoing process. Um, and so, yeah, LRAF on the NAPSI website gets updated roughly quarterly. And that's the, the main source. Um, you will see we have a couple of field activities that will cross post their forecast from Seaport onto SAM.gov. Um, shout out to Dave Waltz at uh, Newark Keyport out in Washington State. I know he does that on a regular basis. Um, so you'll see a couple other places like that. And then some field activities on their website, they will have more detailed information on their forecasts. Yeah, and I'll um, state about the LRAF something. So if you are looking at the LRAF, first I wanna say it's projected out for 72 months. So we try to make it an actual long range forecast. So we're looking at things 72 months out and as time goes on every quarter, it's updated so the data can get more um, substantial as far as that procurement when we know more information. But we try to put it as far to the right as we can so that small businesses have an opportunity to look at that and say, hey, this is something I may be interested in, but maybe I won't go after as a prime. Maybe I need to team with someone. So they have that opportunity to do that. Um, another comment I want to make on the LRAF if you're looking at the LRAF and you see a requirement that you are interested in, reach out to my office and let us know. Um, the further in advance, the better. So that way we can start talking to the program offices, the requirement holders, trying to determine if this will be a small business set aside, you know, try to help them with market research, uh, whatever we can do to make that influence. Um, to change it to be a small business set aside or either sever some of the pieces of a larger procurement out to make it um, amenable to small business. So again, let us know that. And I know this was not a question, but I'm going to talk about sources sought notices and requests for information. So um, anytime you respond to one of those for NAVC, reach out to my office and let us know as well, because that way we can circle back around and um, look at the uh, results, we always, we're always trying to make the rule of two. So when we know that there are two viable small businesses that are capable and their price are reasonable um, and they have submitted, uh, th thrown their hat in the ring for an opportunity through an RFI or a source of sought notice, then we like to talk to the requirement holders to try our best to change that procurement to be a small business set aside. And we've been successful in doing that when we know that those companies that have, you know, thrown their hat in the ring for that opportunity are uh, capable and uh, to doing that work. So we'll take the next Great. question. Yeah. Um, so we had a couple of questions about um, Seaport. So um, the Seaport Next Generation is uh, the Navy's mandatory vehicle for professional and engineering support services. Um, and it's man the program management office for that vehicle is out of NAVC. Um, the, the next on-ramp is anticipated to be in FY 2024. Um, so that is not gospel. That <laughs> is uh, Don't hold a us rough, to that date. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a rough estimate. Yes. Um, so you know, if, if you are interested in becoming a prime contractor providing professional and engineering support services for the Navy uh, and you're not on Seaport, that needs to be part of your two-year plan for your business. Um, and the way you do that is you get past performance supporting the Navy. You can earn that past performance to get on the vehicle through subcontracting, and it does not need to be 200 FTEs. Um, it can be one. It can be one FTE you get. So if, yes. if, if, if that's part of your growth plan is 
breaking into to Navy professional support services, uh, the time to do that is right now if you don't already have it. So set yourself up for success when the, the on-ramp does open up. We do have over 2,000 small businesses on that vehicle. We have some really great um, small business partners providing support services for us on there. So, um, and it is a lot of administrative work to modify a Mac with 2,500 some companies on it. So the on-ramps are not going to be every six months. Um, I think we last had one a year or so ago. So uh, if you're trying to get on that vehicle, 2024-ish is our estimate of when the on-ramp will open up and get yourself ready right now. Agree. All right. Let's see. We got uh, got yeah, so many questions, which is awesome. Uh, let's see. What's another one we can talk about? We have a couple Civic questions. Um, so let's just pluck one. I have an Air Force Civic Phase One, and I want to connect with the Navy to contract a Civic Phase Two or Three. So for that one, I would say. Um... The first thing you want to do, the CIBR has, they, there's a website where you can go and look at, I guess it's the BAA's broad agency announcements that NAVC puts out for CIBR projects. I would first look at that and see if the project you're doing with the Air Force aligns with the need of something NAVC is looking to do. So um, I know that they've rewritten the SBIR um, process to where you can actually start as a phase two as opposed to a phase one now. But I would start by looking at the broad agency announcement to see if a topic has been posted by NAVC that aligns with what you're doing with the Air Force. And if so, then reach out to my office. We can connect you with the program office or with the SBIR program office um, for more details on, on the CIBR program. Yeah, this the CIBR program is a really important way the Navy and the DOD access innovation. Um, and we work cl closely with the Cyber office, but uh, like Ms. Bannister said, there is a dedicated team um, at NAPC that focuses solely on the SBIR. So the Small Business Innovation Research and Small Business Technology Transfer um, programs. So those are the two programs that are dealing with those. Um, so definitely reach out to those um, resources on our the NAVC public website and those BAAs are how you want to kind of follow those opportunities, as Ms. Bannister said. Um, what's the community outreach schedule? Ah, that's a good one. So, um, you know, uh, coming out of COVID, uh, we are ramping up more to try to do more in-person outreach. Um, as I stated before, every Thursday we try to do um, capability briefings. That was one of the good things that came out of COVID, if anything, as far as our, our business processes, is we learned that we could meet with companies virtual um, and, and start building that relationship that way. Um, that was saving dollars because the companies didn't have to travel to the Washington Navy Yard to meet with us. Um, and we could still have that one-on-one -on -one time to hear about their capabilities, hear how we could help them and start building that relationship. So we are still doing that virtually. Uh, uh, as Dan mentioned, our Small Business Industry Day, we're gonna have that again this year in a hybrid. Uh, we do outreach with um, Sea Air Space, Navy Gold Coast, um, various, um, fleet maintenance, symposiums. Um, so I think one thing that we could possibly look at doing, Dan, and, and this is an action that we're gonna take back is to try to post our um, outreach calendar onto our forward facing website. So folks can go there and say, hey, I wanna, you know, meet up with the NAVC Small Business Office, where are they gonna be? You know, we did the 8A, I think we have a hub zone that's coming up in a couple of weeks that we are gonna to try to hit as well. So um, yeah, I think that would be a good thing for us to do. So um, thanks whoever provided that question because you've given us an action and we're gonna go off and make that happen so it can be more visible to you guys. So yeah, I would say give us, give us about a couple of weeks and go to our website and you'll see our outreach events. What do you think, Dan? Great. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't see any reason why we can't do that. Um, the ones, the, the kind of key events, outreach events that uh, you'll 
more than likely always see us at our Sierra space in Washington, DC every spring. Um, and the Navy gold coast event, um, out in San Diego every year, uh, in addition to an annual small business industry day. And then I know we make an effort to, uh, go to as many, uh, socioeconomic oriented outreach events as we can women's chamber hub zone. Um, I think we were looking for a veteran owned, um, event to go to, to make sure that we're, uh, doing outreach with all the different socioeconomic programs. Uh, yep. Another question we got is, uh, can I be connected to um, project and program managers relevant to my capabilities? Uh, you, you certainly can. And when I was talking earlier about the long range acquisition forecast or the LRAF on the NAVC small business uh, portion of the NAVC public website, there's also a list of deputy program managers. Uh, these are individuals who, as a kind of collateral duty, are also identified as small business advocates for their respective programs. Um, so that sheet has a on the NAVC website has all their phone numbers and the office that they support. Uh, it doesn't have names because those people rotate out quite a bit uh, as they get experience managing different types of programs. So that's one place that you can go out to reach out to them. Our industry day is another one. Um, and then a lot of those um, kind of tailored ones. So if you're if you're selling small boats and craft, uh, the International Workboat Show is one that typically uh, NAFC personnel go to. If you're in maintenance, corrosion, uh, the American Society of Naval Engineer events typically have quite a few uh, NAFC people attending those. So getting in touch with them on the phone through the deputy program manager list, going to events that they're attending, and uh, you can always also lean on our office as a resource to help uh, connect you with those people as well. And um, Dan, I'll put a plug out for PEO Ships. So PEO Ships will be having an industry day. Um, it's going to be October the 6th. It's going to follow our industry day the NAVC Enterprise Industry Day, which is October the 5th. But PEO Ships is doing um, a acquisition specific event uh, for professional support services. Um, again, that's going to be on the 6th of October. It's going to be advertised on um, SAM.gov. Um, I would say look, look out for it um, in the next week or two to be announced. You might want to put a tickler in there if you're interested in attending. Um, they're going to have their program offices talking about their requirements. They're going to have some of their um, large business primes, uh, manning tables for some to talk to smalls about subcontracting opportunities. But um, I think this is um, really going to be a great event and we're trying to set it up so that Companies who are in the DC area and coming to the actual uh, actual industry day in person will have the opportunity to stay over if they register for the PEO ships event to save you money on having to travel back and forth. So I'm really happy that uh, PEO ships reached out to us to collaborate um, to do this industry day together. Great. I'm going to try doing one of these answer live ones at the QA okay. uh, just because we have. 10 minutes left and I want to try it out. Um, <clears throat> all right, the question was, how can I get a history of procurements by federal supply codes? Um, so the uh, the primary way that you're gonna get that information is through SAM.gov's uh, data bank. And so the public has access to that information. There's a 90 day lag for DOD contract actions. Um, but if you're trying to get a historical view of what system command, so like NAFC, NAFC or what contracting office, so NAFC headquarters or uh, Navy uh, Surface Warfare Center, Dahlgren, which one's buying products in kind of those broader areas. Um, SAM.gov is the resource that you want to learn how to use and leverage that. It's going to be a really important part of doing market research is finding out which customers are historically buying products and services that you provide. Um, and if you need help with how to manipulate that data, I think that's one of the key services that our PTACs can provide. Um, 
So that's not something our office will typically uh, provide to a vendor or small business. Um, we want to kind of make sure you're leveraging the the source of truth the sam.gov and and learning how to use that so you can do it over and over again. Um, so that's how you get history of procurements by, I, we typically refer to them as product service codes um, here, uh, PSCs, but I think it's pretty analogous to federal supply codes as well. Okay. Um, let's see, does NAFC leverage small, uh, leverage GSA schedules to access small businesses? I would say, um... I I would have to research that to be honest with you. I know maybe for some some very um, low dollar figure buys, you know, our SAP office, which is run out of Corona for NAFSI headquarters, but they may use GSA schedule for some of their procurements. But overall, I think if you're talking, depends on what type of procurement you're referring to. If it's for any type of services, we primarily use Seaport. Um, if it's it for any kind of manufacturing, uh, we would probably just do a regular announcement for that. But I have seen times when didn't they recently buy some small boats off of the GSA schedule, Dan? And I think yeah, that was we bought we bought some tugs, we bought some tug boats on the GSA schedule. So um, not something that doesn't happen, but um, it, I think you know when we say GSA schedules, a lot of times people are thinking about Oasis or Stars or uh, professional support contracts and um because we have the seaport vehicle that is um you know and it's mandatory for navy use that's where i think we would use the gsa schedules a lot but we use um seaport so there are some gsa buys but i wouldn't say overall it's a significant um marketplace for nav mm -hmm. <clears throat> let's see let's do another live one does does it mean you do not set aside <clears throat> solicitations for HubZone or 8A small business contractors? Do you have sole source contracts? Um, I think this was in reference to a discussion we had earlier. Um, and I will say HubZone set asides, not super common at headquarters. We've done a couple of them recently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we follow the FAR. So when we have uh, an action that's above the simplified acquisition threshold, we do market research. And the first preference is to do a set aside in a socioeconomic program, whether that be hub zone, woman owned, veteran owned, um, or an 8A contract. Um, if we can't do one of those, then the second preference is a small business set aside. And if we're not able to satisfy the rule of two, then we procure through full and open competition. Um, we do have some sole source contracts, mainly in the 8A program. But again, because we have that seaport vehicle, um, which a lot of times, um, a lot of businesses developed in the 8A program through professional support services, a lot of that's done on seaport. So uh, our aspect of the seaport vehicle is you cannot do sole source contracts. Every action, every task order must be competed. Um, mm -hmm. So we don't have 8A sole source to the degree that some other agencies may. Right, right. And again, Dan, like you said, it all comes back to we follow the FAR and um, you guys out there have to let us know that you're out there because the rule of two, if you can help us meet it, then we're going we're gonna to fight tooth and nail to make sure it goes that way. But we need to make sure that that rule of two is met. And, and you help us by when you um, respond to... Um, RFIs, sources, sought notices, or solicitations. So that's very that's very important. That's how we can make things set aside. So good question. Great. Uh, I think we <clears throat> might have time for what? Maybe one more, maybe? All right. Yep, other than more cold, question. Okay. Other than cold calling <clears throat> prime vendors identified an FPDS, which is the old name for the SAMDEC of uh, reporting that I was talking about right now, just so everybody knows. Uh, if a lot of times people will use them interchangeably since it just changed over a year or two ago. Um, so other than cold calling firms in FPDS, how do you recommend outreach for subcontracting opportunities? Yeah. Um, so the, yeah. the main, the main one there is SBA's subnet. Uh, if you're not yeah. on that, uh, that's kind of the formal way to, to interact with those um, large primes. They're typically at every event that we go to for outreach like that, National 8A conference, 
or hub zone matchmaking or women's chamber of commerce matchmaking, we're typically sitting next to White O's, Huntington Ingalls, Lockheed. They're all there also. So, um, you know, if, if that makes sense for you to, I know they, they do charge money to attend these events, uh, but if that makes sense for you, that's another place that you can meet with these large vendors one-on-one. So maybe find a couple, find a, a large prime that you're interested in subcontracting with. There's good alignment with your capabilities. Oh, and I see that they're attending this event for matchmaking. That might be a great resource in addition to, you know, the cold calling and everything that you might typically do to develop um, subcontracting pipeline. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And and like I said, the event that PEO Ships is having where they're bringing out primes to um, talk with small businesses, um, use us as a resource. And we're not matchmakers in my office per se, but we can... Um, uh, we do have a listing that we have of our primary small business liaison officers, and they're called SBLO, small business liaison officers. They're individuals that work at the primes whose sole responsibility is finding small businesses to uh, subcontract with them. So we have um, companies that we work with as our primes, and we have relationships with some of those SBLOs as well. So that's always another resource. So reach out to us as well. It's that's good such idea. a good point. The I was just at um, an industry day uh, locally here in Arlington, Virginia, for a NAPC requirement um, that I think had around 200 people attend. And oh man, what a great opportunity to to network with a large prime that's interested in opportunity that you're interested in as well. Um, that's one of the great things about you know coming back to in person events is it makes it a lot easier just walk up to someone and ask for their card and start a conversation and know that you're both there for the same requirements. So there's already alignment. Um, So yeah, going to those industry days, uh, that's such a good, um, a good way to, to build connections with large primes for sure. Okay. Okay, so it looks like it's uh, 1.59, 2 o'clock. I think we've got through quite a lot of questions, but I know we still have more to answer. So what we're going to do is make sure we um, provide a response to all of the questions because we really appreciate you taking the time to ask them. So we're going to make sure we uh, give you a timely response back. Um, And with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Ms. Mercedes. Thank you. So thank you, um, Ann and Dan. Um, we want to thank the NAFC team, um, the director, Ms. Ann Bannister, and the deputy director, Mr. Dan Duckowitz, for participating in this Ask Me Anything um, Don um, webinar. Um, for those of you who are asking, um, all of the questions will be answered, um, those that were submitted previously and that were submitted um, during the live webinar, and will be posted online um, under previous events on on the Don website under previous events. Um, Also, we ask that you keep your eyes out for another Don OSBP office hours and a GSA upcoming webinar. Um, And all of those events will happen after our huge uh, event that we have coming up, which is Gold Coast, September 6th through the 8th. And that is an in-person event. Um, Dan and Ann talked about that. So hopefully we will see some of you all there. Um, Again, thank you all for participating today. And we look forward to seeing you for another Ask Me Anything session. Thank you.